welcome to the first panel of the Carl Jasper Society of North America at the 116th Annual Meeting of the American Philosophical Association here in Denver, Colorado. Um, I also wanted to formally invite everyone here uh, that there will be sessions on Friday as well, and that after the ses ses sessions are over on Friday, there'll be a social gathering um, at the lounge, and that everyone here is invited. Um, let's see, my name is Jillian Coleman, and I'm going to be your chair today. And our panel will be discussing humankind as historical beings, Carl Jaspers and Jose Ortega y Gasset. Um, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Binder. She has studied in Spain for oh, about 12 years, got her PhD from Akalar University, and her interests are philosophy of history, history of philosophy, Spanish and continental philosophy. Um, her paper is called Two Philosophers of 1883, Jaspers and Ortega on the Historicity of Being Human. Yes, my talk is titled Two Philosophers Born in 1883, Jaspers and Ortega on the Historicity of Being Human. Spanish philosopher Jose Ortega Gasset and German philosopher Carl Jaspers were both born in 1883, and they both maintain the position that humans are historical beings. Therefore, as attested by this notion itself, not surprisingly, there are points in which their philosophy coincides. When Jose Ortega Gasset was 15 years old, he witnessed an event that would have an, a particularly important impact on his philosophical thought, as well as on the history of his country that ensued. In 1898, Spain lost its last vestiges of an illustrious past of wealth and global dominance when the Americans swiftly won the Spanish-American War, with armed conflict lasting just a few months which resulted in the loss of the last territories of the Spanish Empire, Cuba, and the Philippines. The resulting damage to the general Spanish psyche was one factor among many that left the nation open to many of the perilous trends that would arise in the early 20th century. For example, war. For Spain, most devastating was the Spanish Civil War from 1936 to 1939. This ended with the installation of another of these disastrous trends of the early 20th century, fascism, with the rule of dictator Francisco Franco, who would remain as the head of the nation until his death in 1975. These directions, among others, were of course deeply troubling to Ortega, who ended up spending a significant period of his life abroad as a result, in mostly Argentina as well as Germany, both voluntarily and not. After the Spanish-American War, Spain was acutely divided on how to heal the damaged psyche and restore national confidence. A group of renowned artists and intellectuals arose, appropriately, uh, appropriately termed the Generation of 98, who were concerned with finding answers to this and how to best direct the future of the country. A main division that arose within this group of the Generation of 98 was between the Hispanizantes and Europeizantes, the former being comprised of those who saw the solution to Spain's problems in looking back to the tradition and the Hispanicizing their country more by further shedding foreign influence and the latter encompassing those looking ahead to other more advanced European nations as models. Ortega was a Europeizante, part of the group that aspired to make Spain more European, and for him it was clear the advanced model he thought Spain should aspire to, Germany. He wanted to immerse himself in this culture, and hence in 1905 he was off to the University of Leipzig where he spent eight months. He returned to Germany after just a summer back in Madrid and spent a year at the University of Berlin, and then another six months at the University of Marburg. It was in Marburg where he became especially influenced by neo-Kantianism. Particularly important for the study here, neo-Kantianism, of course, incorporated historical elements into the philosophical discourse of the time. We can summarize Ortega and Jasper's overlapping notions of our historicity as sharing the following key defining features. First, our being is not comprised of solely nature in the strict biological sense of the term. Rather, what we have is history. In other words, we are not solely biological beings. Second, this leads to the presumption of the lack of something static and fixed. Therefore, our historicity is in constant flux since it is existing in ever-flowing time. Third, this then means we are existing on an incessantly flowing continuum of existence of historical determinacy, as we are at any given time beings embedded in a historical moment. And finally, fourth, this historical determinacy implies that we are existing, living in limited freedom as a self that must navigate its way through concrete temporal historical circumstances. This is captured in a notion of what I will call here as a kind of historical perspectivism that is similar in both philosophers. The first noted way to conceive of this shared notion between Jaspers and Ortega of humankind as historical beings is through a denial of an ontological foundation in nature, in the strictly biological sense, and to replace it with history. Jaspers declared, quote, compared with nature which is alien to me, history is the existence of my own essence. 
He declares further, the finitude of every historical appearance, the relativity of every human conception is the last word in the historical view of man or woman." End quote. Moreover, if we apply the broadest notion of hi history as simply past time, this would include the biological notion of heredity. Hence, man alone has a history, Jaspers says, that he does not live only by his biological heritage, but also by tradition. Man's life is not merely a natural process. In the origin and goal of history, Jaspers argued that we are historical as spiritual beings, not natural beings. At first, this may seem to differ from Ortega, given the Spanish philosopher's more non-religious leanings, though he does not completely deny the influence of religion, of course. But Jaspers' use of the term spiritual is complicated, and I don't believe is meant to be understood in a strictly religious sense. After all, his selection of the axial age is meant to overcome this problem precisely by picking one particularly defining moment in history for humankind, universally, regardless of religion. By spiritual, I believe he was referring more to the sense or essence of tradition that is passed on. As he stated, quote, it's not heredity that makes us human, but always the content of tradition. And here I believe he means heredity again in the strict and sole biological sense. This relates to his notion of existence and the idea of our being not just an existence, but we are existing as a gerund. There is possibility, choice, potential. Certainly this is an effective way to cope with the dismal times they lived in with death and suffering all around. Indeed, we have choice, but we can never start fully afresh. We are always carrying our history with us. We never cease being historical beings, though we may reinterpret our potentials that have been shaped by the past as historical agents. Life is a drone, shared Ortega. Humankind makes itself, as he said, quote, infinitely plastic to be as you like. And he additionally declared, history is the reality of man and woman, for he or she has no other. Through history, he or she has made him or herself such as he or she is. To, to deny the past is foolish and illusory, for the past is man's and woman's nature." End quote. There are no degrees of reality with nature, whereas there are with human existences. As historical beings, we must never forget our past. This is something else, Jaspers argues, is quite prominent in his time. As he claimed, there is one great anxiety. The world is pervaded by terrible forgetfulness and he advised that we should shudder at the possibility of terrifying despots wanting to blot out history. Certainly, the appearance of forward-focused totalitarian leaders resolved to destroy tradition and erase history warranted this concern of his. No reality is more essential to our self-awareness than history, declared Jaspers. History is the constant, ever-flowing progression of time. As Jaspers wrote, historicity is objectively and subjectively the absolute unrest caused by the instability of things in time. It is not the mere passing of things which we observe in processes of nature. Historicity relates the present to the past and to the future so as to penetrate mere temporality and continuous communication. Historicity, therefore, is existing as a continuum in which the present is made up of material from the past, so the present is past and the past is present, as well as the potential future. Ortega argues for historicity as a continuum as well, as apparent by his stress on how a human's being progresses in the sense of becoming. Quote, the completed experiences of life stretch into the future of humankind. If we don't know what he or she is going to be, we know what he or she is not going to be. One lives in view of the past. Thus about humankind, it must be said not only that his or her being is variable, but this being grows and in this sense it progresses, end quote. Hence uh, Ortega's frequent, albeit commonplace, plea that we need history in order to make sure we do not fall back into the errors of the past. There is no end nor beginning for the historical universe. Jaspers argued, quote, in existence, however, the present is as historical, is not merely vanishing, but listening to the past, thus capable of speaking to a possible future, growing together from the past and future in substantial nook, end quote. For Ortega, the intelligible historical field must be viewed as part of a continuum. Quote, something when it is a partial reality doesn't end in itself, rather it continues in another, and to begin to isolate it means taking the risk of amputating it, leaving it apart from what is most important about it, meaning it's part as a continuum. This continuum, therefore, provides a foundation for our being. Jaspers explained, quote, existence is historic because it defies completion in time, because it is restlessly self-generating, because it is never in a state of harmony, its anatomical features demand that we change, a challenge that does not cease in temporal existence. We are, therefore, change. Our nature is precisely change. This is why we have no static fixed nature, and this change is what we should focus on. 
We may not be able to step into the same river twice, but we can observe its ever-changing flow, as Heraclitus first said. Ortega argued, human life is thus not an entity that changes accidentally, rather the reverse. In it, the substance is precisely change, which means that it can't be thought of iliatically as substance, argued Ortega. Here, of course, he's arguing against Parmenides and Zeno's belief in the unity of being. We are historical beings embedded in a temporal story of constant change. Our constant reality is the flux of history, the story of the changes that constantly encompass our reality at any given moment. Always defined as the self interconnected with circumstance. This is our historicity for Ortega. The past speaks to us. The future cannot, despite our forward uh, forward-looking tendencies as existing as part of a continuum of past, present, and future. Existence is always reflexive, shares Jaspers. Our being, therefore, has historical determinacy, as Jaspers described it, because we are always beings embedded in a historical moment within concrete, specific historical circumstances. Quote, being phenomenal, unconditional action is temporarily defined and thus historically concrete. End quote. Similarly, Ortega argued, in every instance, limited possibilities are open to a man or a woman, limited precisely because of the, what they have been up until that date. This historical determinacy exists as self in circumstance. As Ortega described it, yo soy yo y mi circunstancia. This is our radical reality. The self existing and thus needing to navigate within historical circumstances. Jaspers correspondingly claimed, as few would deny, that I come to exist by participating in my active world. I do not exist without the world. Ortega insists upon representative realism in the presupposition of the reality of the past and our radical reality as self and circumstance. We are nothing without our histories, because by history we mean broadly not just our own past experiences, but all the past that has come before us. Quote, experience of life is not made up solely of my past, of the experiences that I personally have had. It is built up also of the past of my forebears, handed down to me by the society I live in, end quote. Here we find a shared emphasis with Jaspers on tradition. This is because, quote, man is never the first man, but begins his life or her life on a certain level of accumulated past. This historical determinacy does not mean, of course, that we do not have any degree of free will. The past does not condition us entirely uh, to determine past. Rather, we can accept or not accept details about the past as relevant for our present and future. Historical determinacy refers to our always being embedded in a historical moment. As Jaspers described it, quote, I am in this historical period, in this social position, male or female, young or old, led by opportunity and by chance. The border character of my being tied to a unique situation within the narrow limits of my conditions, end quote. Limit or border situations, as Jaspers uh, calls them, awaken us through the questioning of these significant moments, which is, in fact, similar to Ortega's notion in history of pivotal moments of crises when new ideas that occur to us convert to beliefs that are in us. Historical consciousness, or our ability to observe and learn about past events, as Jaspers defined it, may or may not relate to our personal lives until, that is, we possess a consciousness of our historicity. That is part of existence part of how we understand and exist within this knowledge of our present as a continuation of the past and previous existences. Jaspers explained, in historical consciousness, I become aware of myself in communication with other selves. I am, as a self, bound to time, to the flow of my own unique situation and events. End quote. The cornerstone of Ortega's philosophy of the radical reality as self and circumstance is indeed similar to what Jaspers describes here. Existence, in part, is an individual recording of changing circumstances. Thus, the window that we have to this radical reality is found in what I would like to call here historical perspectivism. Jasper's notion of historic consciousness that we want to focus on converting into a consciousness of historicity together becomes a sort of historical perspectivism that forms epistemological and metaphysical foundations for our interpretation of our world, reality, and ourselves at any given time making it relative in this sense, but universal as a mechanism or structural framework. Hence, a means for both philosophers to work to overcome the relativism-absolutism divide, of which neither wanted to be entirely always on one side or the other. This indeed relates to another cornerstone of Ortega's philosophy, his perspectivism, the notion that we all perceive reality from our own point of view. While this might seem so at first gl glance, this is not meant to be solipsistic, which is shared with Jaspers, who also strive to overcome the trappings of a strict relativism. 
In fact, it is the gathering of perspectives embedded in a historical epic that should be the focus of historiography. All knowledge, supposed truths, etc., are perceptions embedded in a specific time and space. Ortega's perspectivism dictates that it is not that one proclaimed truth is true or false, there are multiple truths and falsities, and the one certain falsity is to say that there is only one truth, just like the falsity of saying that there is only one perspective. Quote, things can't be truthful nor false, what is false is the judgment made that something is true or false. This is scarcely different from Jasper's description that, quote, each philosophical persuasion, exemplifying as it does a determinate perspective of human experience, is relatively true, and being the perspective that it is, indefeasibly so. It is only when, for any perspective, the claim is made that encompasses the entire truth that absurdity ensues, end quote. This is logical, as there is no way to capture a complete uh, picture of something in one perspective. Imagine how um, different a building appears as, as one walks around it, perhaps use a, a drone from above. No one snapshot is complete, but each snapshot is a piece of the truth, but never a complete one. Therefore, more broadly, the more of these perspectives we gather, the clearer that window becomes into understanding human reality and possible historical truths. Perhaps then what we must focus on is to also work to capture these in the moment, in the present, and preserve them, rather than primarily looking back in time as historians traditionally do. Perhaps historians and historiographers, which we can be for our own lives in the following sense, should be mostly focused on preserving the present and searching for meaning in the present. In a similar sense, history books tell us quite a lot about the time it was published, rather than the contents in and of themselves. A history of ancient Greece will be interpreted and subsequently written very differently in the Middle Ages as opposed to now, for example. So perhaps we can capture the time of publication by considering those different interpretive recordings in a pragmatist sense. Why were those specific details or focuses interesting and useful to record in that moment? And therefore, what does it tell us about that time of publication and recording? And shift focus away from being entirely on the contents in and of themselves. Contemporary knowledge indeed exists in a historical gestalt because we are always limited not only by what may be interesting and useful for us in a particular moment and among specific limiting circumstances individually or as a society, but also by the tools available for interpretation, understanding, and recording in a historical moment. Though there is no time to fully explore this here, while I argue that Ortega has strong pragmatist elements in his philosophy despite his fervent rejection of it, I believe there is some of that in Jasper's as well. We cannot be epistemologically certain if at any time our pragmatic interests in history overlap with an objective historical reality, but from a pragmatist perspective, it still matters what is useful for us to consider as historical fact. There is epistemic possibility in what can be discovered at the time of recording in the knowledge that pragmatic interests make possible. This dialogue with pragmatism has much to offer for the topics of epistemic possibility and the metaphysics of humankind as historical beings. Part of the methodology of pragmatism is derived from history, since usefulness is attested over time. Historical selection and interpretation are largely pragmatically determined. The dialogue between the two is indispensable for the humanities, certainly for the new era of digital humanities that is, that is upon us, with all the new interpretations of historical documents that are to come as a result. As historical beings, our historical consciousness that leads to a consciousness of historicity can be pragmatically understood in being largely shaped by how all the elements that are recorded and become definitional, they must make a practical difference in our lives. Much of the rest of, is ignored, consciously or not. In other words, to better understand ourselves, we must also act as such kinds of historiographers and historians with our own pasts. In conclusion, as historical beings, certainly studying history, therefore, is indispensable for epistemology, metaphysics, ethics. Anything that is as old as human beings thus has a human history. Historians and historiographers must work to avoid the trappings of the lure of storytelling. History must not be about mere storytelling. We must avoid, as Jaspers argued, studying history in a way that, quote, merely thrills and from a mythicizing historiography that consciously produces an intentional and therefore untrue history, end quote. This is also why unearthing the pragmatist elements in Jaspers and Ortega's philosophy of history and historiography is quite valuable indeed. Ortega also commands that, quote, this admirable vocation called history can now stop being mere storytelling, or at best, excellent technique, admirable, necessarily, necessary, highly respected, but mere technique, and become true science, end quote. And as Jasper's further similarly described, quote, history will cease to be a mere field of knowledge, 
and become once again a question the consciousness of life and of existence. It will cease to be an affair of aesthetic culture and become the earnestness of hearing and response. The past, in the broadest sense, not only provides knowledge about the world, but also about ourselves. We should all thus be historians and historiographers, both broadly and individually. In the first century BCE, Cicero wrote essentially of this importance of having a historical consciousness of our historicity. To be ignorant of what occurred before you were born is to remain always a child. We are truly nothing without our histories. We are historical beings. As Goethe wrote, anyone who cannot give an account to oneself of the past 3,000 years remains in darkness without experience living from day to day. Well, I was wondering about the pragmatism part. Um, it, it, I think it's right to see parallels between Ortega and the pragmatists. Uh, but I also understand why Europeans especially uh, disdain the uh, pragmatists because they associate them with you matters of utility and so on and Ortega doesn't seem to be completely free of that either uh, but it, if you actually uh, look closer you see that pragmatism and uh, Ortega have common origins uh, uh, purse uh, spent uh, years studying Kant and uh, especially Kant's uh, pragmatic anthropology. So uh, from Kant, he actually got this idea that uh, ideas are only significant when they make a difference in uh, what we do. And uh, it's not that hard to see the same idea in the Ma book uh, picture of uh, Kant that Ortega um, uh, got as a, a young man, although he d did move away from it. But. I, I think so too, um, and it's it's just interesting because he, he he wrote so much flat out rejecting pragmatism, and and, um, and you know to this day a lot of people I think um, especially abroad it's it's difficult right because um, you know he's he's also hard to classify um, and that's something that makes him makes him special but I definitely think there's a lot of elements that are very very pragmatist. As Freud said it's not always what people say is also what they do and Ortega disassociated himself with as we'll see in my, my presentation with existentialism and, and phenomenology and then we find there's a tremendous amount of, amount of connection. But I was wondering uh, with the storytelling aspect and some other interesting similarities in Ortega's work whether you find that um, uh, Collingwood is an interesting uh, um, person to bring into this discussion. Uh, yes, I regret to say that I haven't, um, I have seen that connection there that mm -hmm. I wanted to explore further, but it's, it's not something that I feel mm -hmm. like I can mm -hmm. elaborate on yet, but I, it's definitely something I want to mm -hmm. look into. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Curious um, about the issue of false history in relation to your paper? Um, I mean, I guess what, what, what immediately comes to mind, um, uh, you know, in thinking about Jaspers, you know, who obviously um, cared quite a bit about what happened in, you know, in, in Germany um, and, and, and the history there. But of course, one of the, one of the, one of the big problems for, ge for German history and German, and even contemporary German historiography, right, um, is, the tendency to deal with issues around, um, you know, the the Holocaust or you know ar around the Third Reich and all that, um, but not deal, for instance, with issues around Germany uh, and its colonialism and genocide in Africa, right? Um, so, g given the account that you've spelled out of of the centrality of history to the human condition, um, what's the role of that actual work to discover? histories that have been concealed and, and, and covered over? And, and, and in what sense is that necessary for the, to fulfill the telos of the human or the, the, the highest ideal or, or something like that? That was a wonderful question. <laughs> um, yeah, the idea of this uh, concept of the, 
the lure of you know storytelling is something that's come up recently. Um, <laughs> this idea that um, part of our human condition is also we really like a good story, um, and to the point that we are willing to forego truth or you know accurate historical um, facts, or we don't want to hear the sad stories, right? Um, and it, it's really powerful, and it, and it clouds our ability to um, understand history better. Um, a lot of the historical texts now, it's it's almost like the, the the storytelling aspect is more important than what they're the facts that they're presenting. But I think, actually, what comes to mind that could be a possible solution is what um, Ortega gets at with this idea to accumulate as many perspectives as possible as our window into something a little bit more accurate. So then it would be precisely that need to gather more, right? Gather more of um, what's what's going on. And he has this theory of uh, theory of generations, where um, in these 15-year increments, he thinks that's specifically the sort of systematic way we can capture those um, perspectives and time, because um, he believes that you know people are more similar based on based on being in one of those generational groups as opposed to something cultural, right? Um, that age is sufficient to make people similar. But if we can capture that generation, of course, you know, globally, that's his idea of this window into um, a more accurate historical reality of the time. And of course, I think, you know, one of the things I was getting at is trying to do that more so, you know, right now, um, it's obviously more difficult doing it in the past since it's Done. This, this is a simpler question, less philosophically interesting, more, more historical. <laughs> uh, so uh, following up on the earlier question, the connection to pragmatism. So Pierre was pointing towards a shared origin. What about direct personal connections at the time? So and to, to the pragmatist, and I'm, I, I know little about Ortega. So also beyond the Marburg influence, uh, can you spell it out? But did he meet Peirce or read Peirce or all of um, James or others, if you could say a little bit more about that. Yes, we know that he had texts from James in his library. Um, and there's some entries in uh, an encyclopedia on um, pragmatism that we think he probably wrote those. So clearly he was familiar with it. He, he read um, pragmatist works most definitely. And there was, of course, um, a small wave of pragmatism in, in Europe. Um, we have Schiller uh, in England, too, um, that was, you know, called his philosophy humanism, but he was definitely a pragmatist. And so it, I think, still existed there, um, even being a you know, small, small portion of things. But um, yeah, he had, he had William James. Uh, we know that in his library. And I think um, in what I've studied of pragmatism, that James is probably the one that parallels him most closely of the pragmatists. Uh, Bergson was an important influence on him. Uh, he actually complained about the fact that uh, uh, Cohen had claimed never to have read Bergson. He found that an outrage. Uh, but he was always very interested in Bergson. And the thing about Bergson is that he has a very positive conception of duration, uh, which uh, Ortega, I think, uh, clearly picked up a sort of realist conception. But he also has this very systematically pragmatist critique of the role of abstraction. So he's all, always interpreting the way we deal with reality in terms of pragmatic utility that in his eyes deform. So he could get it, have it both ways, Ortega. Uh, have these pragmatist elements and then also disavow them because they're just the negative parts of our experience uh, as they are in Bergson. Okay, um, next I would like to introduce Dr. Oliver W. Holmes. He got his PhD from the University of Chicago. He currently teaches at Westland University teaching European, uh, the history of European intellectual history. Um, his areas of interest are f uh, phenomenology, philosophy of history, and concept of self, theory, and methodology. The paper that he'll be presenting is um, on being with others, uh, Jaspers and Ortega. It's interesting, the uh, uh, Monty's paper, and it's almost as though we were saying we're going to look at the, the role of the uh, 
the, the individual in history with Yasmin Ortega. Uh, I'll deal with the historical line that Ismani is saying that, and you deal with the, the inter interrelationship between self and other, uh, um, self and circumstance. We, don't, we know, know one another, we didn't meet before, but it's an interesting kind of compliment to her paper. Uh, Karl Jasper's name is often associated with Martin Heidegger as founders of German existentialism. And rarely has his, his name been affiliated with Ortega Gasset, whose name also has been connected with existentialism, Heidegger, and Husserl. Uh, and each thinker, that is to say, Jaspers, Heidegger, and Ortega, denied any affiliation with the philosophical school of thought, although there are lines of, of, um, of connections that one make, they may make, and this is what's happening here. So that their fundamental philosophical interests, uh, as well as influences in both, uh, not only the time of their birth, but the, uh, the, the correspondence of their experience in Germany at the different universities, but nonetheless under the influence of German philosophy as a whole, and being at a very uh, interesting time in the 1920s and 30s. As contemporaries, both sought to proceed beyond the antimonies of classical metaphysics, such as rationalism, empiricism, you know, the classic division, reason, experience, theory, praxis. And this, so this essay will examine their respective concepts of selfhood being in historicity and how the family connection of these concepts pertain to existential phenomenology and invite comparisons in their philosophies of human existence. Uh, Jaspers reflected historically on the contemporary situation in Europe philosophically uh, giving the historical background of the 17th and 18th centuries, where you have these uh, antitheses um, coming from the scientific revolution to the emphasis on reason and to the 19th century, the emphasis on, uh, on idealism or romanticism, and he felt that it was very difficult to reconcile these, uh, these antinomies. Uh, but he thought in the 20th century, and I will quote, quietly, something enormous has happened in the reality of Western man, a destruction of all authority a radical disillusionment in an overconfident reason and a dissolution of bonds have made anything, absolutely anything, seem possible. Philosophizing to be authentic must grow out of our, our new reality and there take it to stand." End of quote. This is from his uh, uh, intellectual uh, um, um, biography. The new reality to which Jaspers refers returns to the profound significance of Kirk Kierkegaard and Nietzsche in the as the contemporary as representing that contemporary philosophical situation. Philosophy, Jasper Alpine, was never the same after their influence because of the degree to which each had sparked an acute awareness of human conditions. Quote, common to both of them is a type of thought in humanity which was indissolu indissolubly connected with the moment of this epoch and so understood by them, end of quote. This concern with the human condition and the historical situation in which individuals find themselves identifies the efforts Jaspers and Ortega made to overcome the continual bifurcation of reason and experience. Jaspers reflected further upon the, quote, great stars of philosophers' heaven, going from Plato and Plotinus through Augustine, uh, Nicholas Cusa, uh, Giordano, uh, uh, and, and Spinoza through Kant uh, and Hegel um, uh, and Goethe. And of course, his contemporary Max, Max Weber uh, who had a tremendous influence on him. Even in history of philosophy, he remarked, we can witness the tremendous incisiveness of our age. Kant, especially crucial in Jasper's turn of mind, made an incisive comment concerning his century after often referring, often referred to, that is the 18th century, the Enlightenment, and his essay, quote unquote, what is the Enlightenment? Ages are not enlightened, he declared, only individuals. The concept of rationality associated with the period of enlightenment had been characterized by the confidence of rendering reality intelligible through indubitable categories of reason. Through his injunction, dare to know, Kant's perception of the enlightenment became inexorably aligned with the idea of a self-critique. Through Kant's project of self-critique, the concept of reason was to become aware of its boundaries. This critical way of thinking proposed by Kant which recognized conceptual boundaries proved appealing to Jaspers in his search for understanding how individuals become aware of being in the world. In this quest, Jaspers joined Ortega and some of their contemporaries in recognizing that I become a self with other selves 
and am confirmed in my uniqueness through being made present by others in intersubjective communication. The process of self-analysis through inter interpersonal interaction, the abiding relevance of history of philosophy thus indicates the degree to which the intellectual and historical context inform the kinds of philosophical questions raised by Jaspers concerning being in the world, existence. The relation of individuals of, of individual self to other selves, which Jaspers characterizes as communication, quote unquote, discloses the development of being in the world as one of freedom and responsibility, both in quotes. His philosophy of existence developed the methodological principle of, quote unquote, existential elucidation, a method which articulated both the boundaries and quote unquote possibilities of human existence. The concept existence, boundary situations and communication become central categories in Yasper's existential philosophy. In, existen in an existentialist sense, one's being, the I am, I myself, is situated in concrete circumstances within which the potential of human existence becomes actualized. When Yasper reflects on the individual as quote unquote I myself, he ascribed the following conditions under which human self-realization takes shape. The first occurs as the individual experiences the boundaries, the boundary situations of struggle, suffering, guilt, and death. The second condition takes place when the unique, uh, the unique and individual experience of reciprocal existential communication with one another human being, that is, an other. To exist as human beings signifies to be in a situation, quote unquote. And as, quote, existence means to be in situation, I can never get out of the one without entering into another. Any understanding of situation means that I proceed toward ways of transforming them. It does not mean I might change my condition itself. There is nothing I can do about my being in situation. The consequences of whatever I do will confront me as in a new situation, which I have, or, which I have helped to bring about and which is now given, end of quote. Situations such as those within which one has always existed for Jaspers, quote, do not change. For in the process of living, all human beings encounter boundary situations. I am always in situations. I cannot live without struggling and suffering. I cannot avoid guilt. We cannot modify them. All we can do is to make them lucid without explaining or deducing from them something else. They go with existence itself, end of quote. Yasmus' understanding of bounding situations as referring to existence points to the insights he derived from the perspective of existence as a worldly being. The position put forward through this perception makes the argument that we are unable to navigate boundary situations solely with rational and objective knowledge, quote. The meaningful way for us to react to boundary situations is therefore not by planning and calculating to overcome them, but by the very different activity of becoming the existence we potentially are. We become ourselves by entering in open, with open eyes into the boundary situations. We can know them only externally and their reality can only be felt by existence. To experience boundary situations is the same as its existence." End of quote. Gospel provides a world of bounded situations in which challenges and frustrations become insurmountable. A world filled with complexities and amb ambiguities in which traditional categories, categories of science and reason appear to be insufficient. A world, as a result, which throws the individual back on him or herself with a choice between faith and despair. The experiences of struggle, suffering, guilt, and death explain the anxiety evident in human condition. We are so exposed, he reflected in his intellectual biography, that we constantly find ourselves facing nothingness. Our wounds are so deep that in our weak moments we wonder if we are not, in fact, dying from them. At present moment, the security of coherent philosophy, which existed from Parmenides to Hegel, is lost." End of quote. A few passages later, Gospel proffers his explanation of how absence of coherence and meaning of life contributed to the loneliness and despair we, we humans experience, quote. The community of masses of human beings have produced an order of life and regulated channels which connects individual in a technical, technically functioning organization, but not inwardly from the his historicity of their souls. The emptiness caused by dissatisfaction with mere achievement and the helplessness that results when the channels of relation break down have brought forth a loneliness of soul, 
such as never existed before, a loneliness that hides itself, that seeks relief in vain in the erotic and irrational until it leads eventually to a deep comprehension of the importance of establishing communication between man and man, end of quote. Uh, in the myth of Sisyphus, Camus makes an uh, interesting sort of comparison, which draws it also an interesting parallel with his own characterization of, of the tendencies of philosophy from the 17th century to the present. Uh, and, and he felt that what has happened and this common experience of the, of the 1920s and, uh, and 30s, he identifies the auspices to be very important with this notion of, of this meaninglessness of life when we encounter this suffering and guilt uh, and the notion of death. Uh, and, and very often, because of that thin line between this sense of the meaninglessness of life and the all, all the possibilities of being suicide, often leads one, those of us in this loneliness, uh, which uh, was characterized by, by Jaspers to, to commit suicide. And, and Camus says, no, the point is to live. And, and we see this, um, this injunction of Nietzsche uh, is taken up by Jaspers. Nietzsche's injunction to affirm life calls for a commitment which assesses human existence and the fact of its constraints and possibilities. Jaspers characterizes the boundary situation of the human condition as the inevitable fact that individuals always exist in a particular situation at a certain time in history. I exist at a specific historical moment, in certain social circumstances, and with specific inherited biological characteristics. Quote, the boundary situation of being subject to the singular constraint of my data derives its poignancy from the contrasting thought of man at large and of his due in, our state of, and his due in any state of perfection. Yet at the same time, and in every situation, the constraint allows for the possibility of an uncertain future. The unrest of the boundary situation is that what is up to me lies still ahead. My freedom in it is to assume given facts, to make them my own as if they had been my will. While the first boundary situation makes men aware of the, of the historicity of all existential existence, particular boundary situations, death, suffering, struggle, guilt, affect each individual as general ones within his specific historicity of the moment, end of quote. To explicate the individual's ex existential response to the boundary of human existence, Yasmus employs the Latin expression of amor fati, a term he associated with both Machiavelli and Nietzsche, to emphasize the historic import of human proactivity. For as individuals immerse themselves in the form of creating human possibilities and becoming in time, each takes the immersion as quote unquote mine, and this mind, quote, amor fati, I love it as if I love myself, for only in my fate can I be existentially sure of myself. Here, objective constraint becomes for existence an experience of being. The sense of historicity as a sense of fate means to take concrete existence seriously, end of quote. This sense of the immediacy of historic consciousness informs us that, quote, I know myself to be identical with the particulars of my existence, end of quote. The existential situation entails, quote, nothing but the singular and definite realization which no longer needs to be justified to generalities. The existential reply, that is, to general standards, is, quote, amor fati, the historic consciousness of adopting the particular as definition turned into the depth of existence itself. Within my amor fati lie the negation of specific conditions of my existence and finally of my whole fate the possibility of suicide, as well as the possibility of strife and defiance, end of quote. The existential response thereby becomes an important component in the process of human self-realization, which leads to the recognition and understanding of, quote unquote, situation being in a social world of other individuals. The world of social relations or community in all of, your, uh, in all of its ramifications, this society, this state, the family, this university, the profession of mind, encompasses the auspice concept of communication in the idea and in its realization of existence. Moves and um, moves an individual closer to his or her fellow person. The quote, "I myself and another self." For as the auspice continues, quote, "When I come to myself, there are two things that lie in this communication: my being I, and my being with another." End of quote. Yaspis eventually makes a marked distinction between, quote, communication and existence and existential communication. The difference underscored for him 
the importance of identifying the manner in which selfhood of the person becomes explicit in identifying the individual unique selfhood with the selfhood of others. In communication that affects me, the other, this one only, uniqueness is a phenomenon of the substantiality of this being. Existential communication is not to be modeled and is not to be copied. Each time it is flatly singular. It occurs between two cells which are nothing else, are not representative, are therefore not interchangeable. And this communication, which is absolutely historic and unrecognizable from the outside, lies the assurance of selfhood. It is the one way by which itself is for self in mutual recognition and, and in, in mutual creation. The tie to it is a historic decision on the part of self. To avoid its self-being as an isolated I and to enter in communicative self-being. It is only in freedom as a possibility that I can understand what it means to say, quote, I cannot, and this is a subquote, I cannot be my free self unless the other is and wants to be himself. And I am with him. And this is the end of this long quote. The elucidation of existence and existential communication. Excommunication, the communication of the self with others allows for the moment that, quote, I realize the particularity, the particularity of my communication and thus its limitations. I feel a shortcoming, in a quote. The self realizes that as single, isolated consciousness, I would not communicate anything, with, with, would ask no questions and give no answers without the self-consciousness of others, end of quote. The experience of shortcomings in existential communication for Yaspers Quote, is my point of departure for the philosophical reflection which I try to understand that to be myself, I need the other for whom no one else can substitute, end of quote. To avert the sense of dread and nothingness, an isolated consciousness may experience. Yaspis promotes the principle that individuals become authentic when they devote themselves to the other. The other take, taken to mean either the community of other individuals or the limiting horizons of situation being. The thesis of my philosophizing is that the individual cannot become human by himself. Self-being is only real in communication with another self-being. Alone, I sink into gloom, isolation. Only in community with others can I be revealed in the act of mutual discovery. My own freedom can only exist if the other is also free. Isolated or self-isolating being remains mere potentiality or disappear into nothingness, end of quote. Yasper's philosophical reflection resonates in a similar point of departure made by, by Ortega. The latter connects the concept of human being closely to his concept of existence through his often cited expression, I am I in my circumstances. In an edition of his works in 1932, Ortega proclaims, I am I in my circumstances. And this is the quote. The, this expression, which appears in my first book, which condenses in final volume my philosophic thought, does not only mean the doctrine that my work expounds and proposes, but means that my work is an ex ex executive case of the same doctrine. My work is, by its essence and its presence, circumstantial. This is precisely what the cited phrase declares, end of quote. He proceeded to proclaim that the new philosophy of human existence, which emphasizes, quote, living in the here and now, was a concept that opposed, quote, unquote, traditional idealism, utopianism, and was discovered in Germany in the 1930s. In moving beyond the epistemological concerns of the neo-Kantianism he studied under Hermann Cohen at the University of Marburg, the methodological approach of philosophy as a, quote, unquote, rigorous, rigorous science of Husserl to the new concept of being Ortega combined the approaches of Wilhelm Diltai, Heidegger, and the later writings of, of, of Husserl. And what is philosophy? And his, what is philosophy? Uh, Ortega uh, aligned his philosophical position with that of Heidegger and the quote unquote new philosophy of being, existence in human life. Uh, and this is a quote. These common words, find, finding oneself, world, occupying oneself, are new technical words and the new philosophy. I will limit myself to observe that this definition, that is to live, is to find oneself in the world. Like all the principal ideas of these lectures, is already in my published work. It is important to me to observe this, especially, with regard to the idea of existence, for which I claim chronological priority. For that very reason, I am pleased to acknowledge that the person who has gone deepest into the analysis of life 
is the new German philosopher Martin Heidegger. To live is to find oneself in the world. Heidegger, in a very recent work of genius, had made us take notice of all the enormous, the enormous significance of these words, end of quote. And this is referring to Heidegger's sign and sight, time and being. And this new perception of historicity gave rise to what Karl Lerberth uh, uh, described as existential ontological in Heidegger and the existential ph uh, philosophical in Jaspers. In 1925, Ortega presented a series of lectures on Husserl's phenomenological approach, in which he projected his own program to study, quote, the restatement of the problem of being, end of quote, for a series of publications. In this quest for, quote, unquote, synthetic thinking, Ortega proceeded to explain how he, quote, abandoned phenomenology at the very moment of accepting it. Instead of withdrawing from consciousness, as has been done by Descartes, we become firm in a radical reality, which is for everyone his or her life, end of quote. He avoided phenomenology where the emphasis appears to, to be abstract in the tradition of idealism. His critical response to Heidegger's formal and transcendental logic, published in 1929, identified this tendency in phenomenology. Several European thinkers who were influenced in one way or the another such of the phenomenological movement, as for example, as Ortega and others, were not, were not necessarily members of the, of the uh, movement, became dissatisfied with the alleged solipsistic standpoint of Husserl's transcendental phenomenology and the formal and transcendental logic. Well aware of his critics, Husserl introduced his ideas, I'm sorry, Hendri Husserl introduced ideas which transformed his earlier position on transcendental phenomenology from a world of isolated ideas into a world of community of intersubjective individuals. In two lectures delivered at the Sorbonne in 1929, the observation and insights made in the lectures were expanded upon in his Cartesian Meditations and the Crisis of European Sciences and Transcendental Phenomenology of 1933 and 35. In these later writings, Descartes' ego lost its abstract, absolute status as it became correlative to the world of human experience. In Cartesian Meditations and the Crisis, Husserl proclaimed that scientific knowledge can be understood only to the extent that we understand first the notion of Lebensfeld. The crisis became famous for its thematic treatment of the concept of life world, Lebensfeld. The study of the lived world and our experience of it, of quote, ego and life relatedness, end of quote, became the primary consideration of phenomenology. In regard to life world, the innovative contribution of the crisis lies in Husserl's effort to provide a thematic account of history and the historicity of the life world. Husserl perceived, quote, the historical world, end of quote, to be pre-given as a social historical world, end of quote. For, quote, to live is always to live in, in certainty of the world. We live wakefully in the world, whereby we are conscious of fellow men in our horizon. Like me, every human being has his fellow men and always counting himself, civilization in general, in which he knows himself to be living, end of quote. Ortega found Husserl's ideas of life world appealing, that it resembled his own discussion of human life. However, Husserl's discussion of the Cartesian meditation of the problem of other people or intersubjectivity and the world as a world essentially inhabited by quote unquote others was conceivably the part of his philosophy which had, had the profoundest effect on the development of existential phenomenology in the thought of Ortega. From the perspective, and this of course Husserl uh, also picked up from, from Heidegger, from the perspective of his intersubjective shift, this intersubjective shift in phenomenology, Ortega harkened back to I and my circumstances as an analytical ontological expression of his general philosophical viewpoint in his later works. For Ortega, the individual's ego's consciousness of self occurs through the awareness of both its physiological features and behavioral gestures and, and those of others in reciprocal human interaction, a conscience of self that perceived through self-analysis of the inner essence of being of an I, that is I's awareness of other selves as similar beings in the circumstances of the world of lived experiences. In effect, he attempted to characterize the nature of an individual's experience of their world and themselves. There is an attempt to distinguish between the fact that one's relationship to an organism is different from one's relationship to a person qua being, and that one's actions toward an organism differs from the manner in which one acts towards a person. Quote, living, he said, is to reach outside of, out of oneself, devoted ontologically to what is other, be it called world of circumstance, end of quote. 
Once human life has been established as Ortega's point of departure, quote, we are ipso facto given two terms of factors that are equally primary and moreover inseparable. Man who lives in the circumstances of world in which man lives, end of quote. As being that lives, the individual relates to other human beings. Uh, and he says this further, quote, all realities must in some way make themselves present or at least announce themselves within the shaking boundaries of our human life, end of quote. Hence the basic reality of human life constitutes the life of an individual with the lives of other individuals as well as situations that encompass the confrontation of the individual with the ex existent realities of physical objects. To this viewpoint of the individual as being that lives in the world or uh, does not perceive the world from the isolation of his or her ego, for the very essence of one's being consists in living act in an actively disclosing manner. Being in the world for Ortega, we learn, as a dual characteristic as it relatedness to circumstances, being in the world functions as being for and with others. Our world, he explains, quote, the world of each one of us is not totem revolution, which but is organized, pragmatic fields. Each thing belongs to one or some other field in which it articulates its being for with that of others, and so on successively, end of quote. All of us, quote, live in, in one and the same world. And from this, he goes to this idea of this, this co-living uh, uh, and make a distinction between not only one's physiological uh, uh, um, identity and, uh, and the historical, um, uh, uh, the histor historicity of, of, of being a human, but also distinguish between objects and animals, and he says that, that it's still more be the interaction between humans. Uh, and therefore, this brings forward the notion that, quote, this means the appearance of the other is a fact that always remains, as it were, the back of our life because our becoming aware of the first time that we are living, we already find ourselves not only with others and among others, but accustomed to others, which leads us to formulate the first social theorem. That is, man is a nativity, in the sense of being you know, a genus, a birth, born, thrown into the world, open to the other, to the alien being, or in other words, before each one of us became aware of himself, he had already had the basic experience that there are others who are not I, the other, that is to say again, man, on being nativated, open to the other, to the altar, who is not himself, is not himself, is nativated, like, like it or not, being open to others, being open to the other, or to others, is permanent and constitutive, and is sort of constitutive state of man, not a defi definite action in, res and, in respect to them. The state is not yet properly a social relations, because it's not yet defined in any concrete act. It is simply coexistence matrix for all possible social day relations. It is possible presence within the horizon of life, a presence which is above all more compresence uh, and other singular and plural. He goes on to reflect on what's involved with this reciprocity and how we understand another human being, and he engages this idea of understanding yourself through the interaction with others. Uh, and, and, and within which you need to transcend that experience as you distinguish between stones, his expression, animals, and humans. And that's the transcendental attitude to which he, he relates uh, and, and likens it to, to Husserl's phenomenology in the crisis and in the uh, Cartesian meditations. Uh, and then he takes issue, however, with this notion of recognized self as other being similar to myself with Husserl's notion of analogical transposition. Uh, and, and within that, this whole notion of Einfühlung, a sense of sympathy with others. Uh, and this notion of sympathy, you know, has a sort of history going back to the 18th century, uh, with, beginning with Hume and in a certain sense with Rousseau, but the sense of we identify others as, as self and this sense of sympathy based on com of, of, of comparable experiences, not identical, but comparable. Uh, and Ortega wanted to maintain this uniqueness as the individual. For the I and the other thereby, thereby are constituted by the appearance before each other in a common world, uh, and each engage in a reciprocal interaction uh, and, 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 through, and through which one avoids that sense of solitude. So in this connection of the individual must live, neither as an isolated individual nor as a conformist to the common social world of the other, rather the individual must live the existence of a unique I. That is to say, as you interact, you, you understand the constraints, but you're not to conform you still create your own possibilities. That is to say, unique individual consists of one who lives in an actively disclosing manner 
and who has the ability both to come out of and withdraw into possibilities which are permitted within the realm of the yous and the we's, the I and the other. Uh, from this perspective, Ortega became concerned with the fundamental pattern of human interaction that underlie the larger context of social reality, and that larger context takes him into the historical dimension. Quote, in the basic structure that is social relations in which man moving, I'm sorry, in which man moves, appearing and defining himself in front of other men, other men, and from the and the pure other, an unknown man and not yet identified individual, becomes a unique individual, the you and the I. But now we have become aware of something that is a constituent factor in all that we have called quote unquote social relations, namely that all these reactions of others in which the so-called social relations consist originates an individual as such, I myself, for example, and are directed to another individual as such. Therefore, the social relations, as it has so far appeared to us, is always explicitly a reality called formally inter-individual, end of quote. So to conclude, the existential phenomenological grounding of humans as unique and autonomous individuals in social relations with others points to affinities with the Ospice and Ortega. Concepts of existential communication, I am I in my circumstances for Ortega and I am myself and I am for Jaspers, constitute interpersonal interrelationships in the context of social life, which is situated in historical time and place. The historical consciousness of their epoch prompted both thinkers in the 1930s to write trenchant common, uh, contemporary criticisms of modern society. Through their respective works, Man and the Modern Age, and the Rebuttal of the Masters, Jaspers and Ortega join Gabriel Marcel, Man Against Mass Society, in criticizing the spiritual and intellectual tendencies of their generation. Analyses of an epical consciousness, quote unquote, that's the Ospis quote, that each thinker identified as fraught with uncertainty, formed with a society dominated by new technologies and mechanization and mass culture. Potential comparisons to pursue at another philosophical forum. Thank you. That was wonderful. Very interesting to find the same um, analysis there mm -hmm. with self and circumstance. Mm -hmm. That shared um, that shared notion with uh, between Yasters and Ortega, mm -hmm. and I think it's interesting. Is this? I think Ortega does a good job of overcoming that bifurcation of reason and existence, yeah, as you no, mentioned. Yeah, since yeah. since for him in that radical reality, that's precisely where reason, you know, our, our vital reason, as he called it, mm -hmm. comes from, because we're forced into this this drama, as he often mm. called it, that forces us to address this, and that's explicitly mm -hmm. where reason comes from. Um, and, and for me, that's also where I always pulled out some kind of more existential elements mm -hmm. with this, mm -hmm. this emphasis on um, the, the suffering in that drama and the anxiety mm -hmm. of being, uh, he often used the metaphor of being on a, on a ship lost, oh, lost yes. at sea, oh, yes. trying to oh, navigate yes. his way. Um, yeah. But but yeah, I, I very much enjoyed mm -hmm. hearing yeah. more on, on that, on mm -hmm. self and circumstances. Okay. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting too. I, I do have, I think, a disagreement hmm. with you on the maybe the historiography. Ah. So um, the way you uh, put it, um, the Ma book school and mm -hmm. neo-Kantianism mm -hmm. were limited to the theory of knowledge and science and then um, these developments came, uh, historicity, um, uh, uh, intersubjectivity, um, uh, ontology. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my view is actually that uh, uh, it was under the influence of the Ma book school, in particular, uh, Nautop and Co uh, actually Kassir, mm. uh, that uh, these uh, themes uh, mm. entered into the thought of Husserl and Heidegger. So uh, one can show that uh, at every stage of Husserl's career, uh, his uh, shift to a new position came under the criticism of Nautop, who was the uh, leading philosopher in his eyes that he took seriously. Mm -hmm. So the uh, Nautop criticized the logical investigations mm -hmm. because they lacked 
the transcendental subject. Then uh, Husserl uh, made a transition mm -hmm. to adopting That's a trans. Right, exactly. uh, and then he criticized the ideas because it lacked a dynamic Platonism, and Husserl began introducing genetic phenomenology. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And uh, the crisis uh, introduced this seemingly new thing of history, which Heidegger wanted to claim for himself, but which was actually uh, the starting point for the Marburg School. And uh, I mean, one only has to look at uh, Kassir's uh, Erkenntnis um, uh, theory uh, to see that he starts off with the idea of the historical development of logic. So uh, they, all of the, oh, and, and the, one, the other thing, uh, ontology. So uh, if you go back to Kassir's book on Kant of 1918, mm -hmm. he explicitly argues that Kant was the first philosopher to pose the question of the meaning of being and he does through that through the Copernican Revolution. And he again returns to this theme in uh, the philosophy of symbolic forms in, in all of its volumes. And those were volumes that Heidegger studied closely when he was uh, in the initial stages of writing Being and Time. So I think the evidence is actually devastating that uh, the question of the meaning of being that Heidegger had always mm -hmm. claimed is, is, is actually taken from uh, Kassir and the Ma book school. Okay, uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, well, we, could, we, we can agree to disagree. Uh, there's there's, 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 a, there's a, 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 a body of evidence that can point in another direction. Uh, meaning by that, at Ma book, you had Cohen and, and, and Nadtrup, yes, it's true. Uh, um, and, and then later Kassira. Um, I, I'm thinking only by way of, um, you know, again, Ortega's response, as he said, a group of, you know, he got together as he was a student with Heimsworth and, and Hartmann, et cetera, and they were wrestling with what he called mm -hmm. that Kantian prison. They wanted to get out of that. And this was, again, this whole issue of methodologies and the backdrop to all of this, right, is still this, this Naturwissenschaften and the, and the Geisteswissenschaften controversy with Bildung Bonn and Rickert, right, and even with Diltai. So you, you have this, this really trying to find in philosophy a science comparable to the physiological uh, of the natural sciences. And then the other position being there has to be a distinction from that, right, because philosophy is distinguished from the philosophical, I mean, from the natural sciences. There's that backdrop. Then when you add to that, um, when, when Heidegger gave a, a seminar at Marburg, right, he spent time looking at uh, um, this history of being, uh, and he gave lectures on Hegel, right? And, and he, now, now Kassir reads into Kant, uh, uh, um, Heidegger reads into Hegel, right, beginning this problem of being. Uh, and again, a way of trying to reconciling these antinomies which developed, you know, in, uh, uh, at the end of the 18th century, the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, and with Hartmann, when Hartmann came to the chair after, after Nottorp and, and, and Marburg, uh, and, when, and of course, um, uh, um, uh, Heidegger moved on to Freiburg, and Hartmann introduced uh, um, um, Heidegger to the importance of Aristotle with this notion of being. Uh, and so that Heidegger gave series of lectures at Freiburg on, on the, the, the the phenomenological relevance of Aristotle. In other words, how you could read Aristotle from a phenomenological point of view, really from by way of the question of being. So, so I mean, there are many ways we can we can look at that. Uh, you know, and, and of course, Kierkegaard was also told at that time. But Heidegger, I'm sorry, Heidegger looked at uh, Aristotle, and he in turn broke away from the tendency what was considered that transcendent. You're right by way of this moving from the logical investigations, and even Ortega picked up that critique, logical investigations to the transcendental. Than to the historical, and I would I would maintain that through Shela and Heidegger, he who sort of got into this philosophical anthropological notion of ont ontology and and sort of expanded on that. So in, in a certain sense, he listened to his students. But I, I would trace the lines, you know, a little differently. Oh oh, <laughs> yes, Sana Samati. Yeah, I I think you know. Okay, first of all, he was saying that. 
uh, I had treated this before in, 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 in a study on Ortega as Ortega having abandoned. Ortega and I, but if he looks closely, I do not say that he abandoned it. But he does state that he abandoned it at the moment. Of, you, you can't ignore that. And I think this is because, his, as I, I quoted, he, he was trying to maintain his priority of everything he said. He said it before Heidegger. He said it before Husserl. There's so much you can reduce by way of the meditations. So you have to look at these later writings. And when you begin to do that, and even he acknowledged in his own writings, I found that this restatement of the problem of being very important beginning with Heidegger. I found this intersubjective shift in Husserl being very, very important. So he was ambivalent, when I said it best. He was ambivalent about phenomenology to the point that where he had that transcendental tendency, he rejected that, that is the formal and transcendental logic, where it get, became that intersubjective shift, he, that what he found acceptable. Uh, and so, and it was, you know, he's, he's written a lot, and, and, and part of which was this way of trying to, to establish a sense of autonomy of thought, uh, when in fact, he himself admitted much of our philosophical posture is, very, is invested in, in what, you know, preceded it. And he himself, you know, I think it displays that notion, how, how influenced he was at the time in the thought. And some of it may have been unconscious, but nonetheless it was very much there. So I do, I, I do not, I agree that he's relevant for, and those, the, the, the philosophical investigation of psychological studies, it was really dealing with this earlier tendency uh, of phenomenology, and I would come back to this, because Husserl was also, by way of your question, influenced by Brentano, and this idea of trying to find for the sense of the mind, autonomous from the physical sciences, and looking at psychology, you know, this descriptive psychology, uh, uh, and he began to, to uh, identify the descriptiveness in phenomenology, uh, uh, and, um, uh, and then later seeing the, the, the difference between that and, uh, uh, um, uh, and, and the, the useful phenomena of, of formal and transcendental logic. Uh, but, uh, but with respect to phenomenology, again, it's problematic as his, his association with, with Husserl, which preceded. And, and, and you know, they met Husserl, I'm sorry, Heidegger and, and Ortega at a festival in Aspen. Uh, and, uh, I'm, no, I'm sorry, they, they did not meet there. He, he met someone else. Uh, but there was a conference in Germany where they met, uh, uh, dealing with technicians and, 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 and engineers. And they had a conversation. He sort of intimated, we never really talked about this issue of priority. It's a very sensitive issue. They talked about other things. Uh, uh, um, uh, and so it's within that framework, one has to, one hand, acknowledge what he says, but also look at what he does. Uh, and that's why I maintain that it's really more ambivalent. He, he never did abandon it. Our last speaker is uh, Dr. Pierre Keller. He has his PhD from Columbia, and he currently teaches at University of Riverside. Um, his areas of interest are Kant, 19th century philosophy and phenomenology, neo-Kantianism, and the history of philosophy. Um, he's also written two books. Uh, one's called Kant, the Demands of Self-Consciousness, and Husler, Heidecker, and the Human Experience. He's currently working on two, two other books. <laughs> one of them is called The Ma Book School and the 20th Century in 20th Century Philosophy, and is also working on the other book um, dealing with Kant and Hegel. Um, see, his paper is called Ortega, Jaspers, and the Dynamics of Reason. Yeah, I've changed it a little to the dynamics of historical uh, reason. The, the idea is the same. Um, I've been uh, pushing back against Michael Friedman's account of the parting of the ways between analytic and continental philosophy and arguing that uh, the conception of philosophy that he comes up with uh, lacks the very dynamics of reason that he's looking for because of its uh, uh, preconditions. And so I'm in effect arguing that uh, if you want a truly dynamical conception of reason, you have to actually go to the as it were, the continental tradition in the parting of the ways. And that parting of the ways, in my view, already occurs with the Marburg School of Philosophy. So they represent a, uh, the development of a dynamic, historical conception of uh, reason, a, a social conception of reason that they then uh, bequeath uh, through Cohen, Nautop, and Kassir to uh, contemporary philosophy to 
uh, Jaspers and Ortega, but also to uh, Husserl and Heidegger. My uh, general framework, though, is actually a larger one. I'm looking at uh, especially how to reinterpret Kant and Kant's influence all the way uh, to the present. And basically, my view is that what most people take the critique of pure reason, for instance, to affirm, I take it to refute. That's my view on almost all of Kant's philosophy. And what I, uh, I take that to be very important because Karl Jaspers and uh, or Ortega uh, both uh, develop a kind of elite uh, cosmopolitanism that's influenced both by uh, Nietzsche and by Kant, uh, which uh, starts from uh, criticisms of certain uh, received views. So their idea is that uh, we should go for a, a philosophical version of Republican uh, democracy in their elite cosmopolitanism. And what I want to argue is that the roots of this go back to Kant, and if you understand Kant correctly, you see that the dynamic, historical, social, uh, conception of reason that they develop is actually the uh, conception of reason that's defended in the critical corpus. So like I say, what most people over there are uh, taking to be Kant, I take Kant to be refuting. And uh, I take Ortega and Jaspers to be digging that out of Kant through uh, the way in which they uh, both took Kant very seriously. So they both uh, had the idea that the philosopher uh, really was Kant and that we needed to think philosophy through by thinking Kant through. So yeah, uh, Ortega talked of, for instance, a, a Kant of the future that he embraced, a, a Kant of the future which he took to take uh, his notion of vital historical reason as its basis. So what I'm saying isn't really outrageous as a reading of uh, Ortega. And it'd be much easier to show the extent to which uh, Karl Jaspers uh, takes the conception of cosmopolitan uh, thought in Kant to be the, the core of Kant's philosophy. I first read Kant through Jaspers and it took me 30 years to find my way back uh, through the influences of the major uh, Kant interpreters. Now there is a dimension to Ortega and Jaspers that, that's clearly a kind of aristocracy of the mind. They, uh, in Jaspers there's the talk of mass society and in uh, Ortega you have the idea of the revolt of the masses. They both endeavor to bring together the resources of history, especially drawing on Nietzsche's the uses and abuses of history, to use history as a means to change the world. Uh, this is what Nietzsche calls the monumental uh, conception of history. History uh, which we relate to as deed and striving rather than as preserving and admiring or as suffer and in need of emancipation which are the antiquarian and the critical conceptions of history. Okay, so Jaspers tries to take this broader conception of cosmopolitan really seriously and after the Second World War he develops a conception of world philosophy that includes the traditions of Chinese, Indian, and Islamic philosophy in addition to a broad uh, uh, grip on European philosophy. And he also tries to engage with faith and revelation and with contemporary issues of war and peace, including the atom bomb and its implications for the future of humanity and the direction that the Federal Republic of Germany was taking. 
Now, Ortega is from the start an important public intellectual in Spain and in the wider Spanish-speaking world who makes a determined effort both to bring German philosophy to Spain and to bring Spanish culture to the world. From the beginning, Ortega is sensitive both to the wider European roots of Spanish philosophy and its connection with the philosophy of the Islamicate. Although especially his student, Julian Marias, is arguably, I think, overly defensive about the expulsion of the Moors and Jews from Spain, about the treatment of the Indians in the Americas, and in, about the Inquisition in his own work on Spain. I don't really think it actually helps him to try to defend Spain against those things. So both Ortega and Jaspers push back against a certain kind of irrationalism. Uh, while they defend a conception of reason that's grounded in life. So Ortega rejected Unamuno's conception of a tragic sense of life. For Unamuno, the tragic sense of life is so defined that all which is vital is anti-rational, not mere, merely irrational, and all of which is rational, anti-vital. And this is the basis of the tragic sense of life. So this got Ortega's uh, juices going, and it, it, it's sort of a part of the inspiration behind this vital uh, conception of reason. There's something similar in Jaspers. So Jaspers rejects Heidegger's claim in his Kant book that Kant's conception of the imagination had shown the bankruptcy of the Occidental notion of reason and logos, and that Kant had fled terrified by his own insight from his own argument. Uh, actually, Kant never thought of the imagination as undermining reason, but as grounded in the formative power of human reason our lives, and that only develops further as Kant's thought progresses. So on that score, Heidegger is just misinterpreting Kant. In both Kant, Jaspers and Ortega, uh, cosmopolitan emerges from what Kant calls the cosmopolitan conception of philosophy. Philosophy that looks at what matters to us as we engage as agents with our most important concerns as human beings in the world. This is a conception that Jaspers especially puts front and center in his interpretation of Kant, but then in the end is also central to Ortega's interpretation and appropriation of Kant. An important feature of philosophy in general for Kant and of the cosmopolitan conception of philosophy in particular is the concern to think things through to the end and thus to trace things back from their historical, social, and natural context back to the manner in which they can be taken systematically to originate in our reason. So on my reading of Kant, Kant is not a philosopher who is uh, disinterested in history. He starts from our historical situation and then endeavors to systematize things to make them quasi-independent insofar as that systematicity is the distinctive systematicity of our historical point of view. And I think, and I'll show that this is actually a governing idea for bo both Ortega and Jaspers uh, in their own vital and historical reason. And, and it actually provides the basis for the ontology of the human being in Kant, in Ortega and Jaspers, and general ontology. And a re result of this is that reason turns out to be essentially historical and action guiding in its systematicity. Before Jaspers wrote his first philosophical works, he had, had already written a general psychopathology with uh, definite influences from Kant. Those influences were even more pervasive in the psychology of worldviews. They also come to the fore in the spiritual situation of our time, which uh, it has a role that comparable in some ways to Ortega's uh, revolt of the masses. Jasper starts 
in this work from our current situation and then seeks to ground our understanding in the way in which we come to terms with the world as a whole. The world and the human being are taken as a transcending, transcendent, encompassing ground of who we are. This corresponds to Kantian ideas according to Jaspers himself and they're already front and center in Jaspers' account of life in the psychology of worldviews. Jaspers and Ortega develop a synthesis of Kantian and neo-Kantian ideas with the life philosophy of Bergson, von Uxküll and Diltai, and with Husserl's phenomenology. But like Heidegger, they're critical of the very possibility of the phenomenological reduction, at least if the reduction is understood as allowing one to suspend one's performative or executive relation to things and to one's life instead of as bringing their performative significance and, and the meaning of their very being into view. And that's actually the way I'd be inclined to read the uh, phenomenological reduction. And Jaspers expresses his distrust of mass society in the spiritual situation of the times, which is translated as man in the modern age. I don't really like that title. That corresponds to the same kind of concern in Ortega's Revolt of the Masses. The, and these attacks on mass society made Jaspers famous in Germany and Ortega famous the world over. In the spiritual situation of the times, Jasper alludes to the importance of the French Revolution in the development, as he puts it, of a specifically new epochal consciousness of time, der Zeit. The new consciousness involves auspicious beginnings and prospects for the beginning of a great fu future coupled with the horror before the abyss from which there is no salvation. Okay, so Jaspers has this idea of a very positive uh, outcome that's possible, but also a very dim outcome, which was actually probably much closer to the truth. Uh, we can see Jasper's own sense both of the prospects for the new post-revolutionary Weimar Republic and his own worries about the possibility of the coming chaos. To be sure, Jaspers notes in a foreword that he was hardly aware of the Nazis at the time in 1930 when he wrote the book. But his concern arose from the chaos that ensued from World War I and the German defeat and the German revolution. And there was, of course, a, also a massive epidemic that killed millions too. Reaction and post-war collapse and the awful times of hyperinflation and the Great Depression fall. So all of this was very much on his mind. But even if Jaspers regarded the German Empire and its especially Prussian aristocracy with critical regard, he also tends to show a genuine horror at some of the mass uh, manifestations of, more, of a more classless society. So there's a sort of attitude of, you know, keep those people away. Okay, so the new epochal uh, consciousness of time uh, was for Jaspers a mark of the revolutionary times inaugurated by the American and especially by the French Revolution. The new epochal consciousness of the times is a transformation that Jaspers connects to Kant's claim in the conflict of the faculties that the French Revolution, despite the terror, aristocratic reaction and repression in neighboring countries like his own Prussia, which went to war with revolutionary France, had become an event that would not be forgotten and would in a certain sense become a linchpin not only for future uh, political developments but for the cosmopolitan cosmopolitical conception of the human being as ultimate self-legislating subject of the cosmic order of how things must appear. So I really think it's important and I could have spend a whole hour discussing Ernst Cassier's work on the idea of a republic. Uh, constitution, which goes into this work in great detail in 1928. And all of these works are concerned with revolutionary changes that are happening, the distanced attitude of those who embrace parts of those revolutionary ideas and, and radically reject other aspects of it. And from this attitude to the revolution come to see the significance of 
history t being understood in a radically new way. So Kant himself viewed the manner in which the uh, spectators of the French Revolution interpreted the event of the French Revolution as a recognitive sign of the will for a republic and a non bellicose state that would become a rememorative sign of that event and its, re and its republican significance and as such would look forward as a prognostic sign to a future without war and with the true cosmopolitan republican self-legislation that would make a po possible a kingdom of ends. So for Kant, the French Revolution, in its significance for people like him, uh, marked a, a fundamental change in history and a kind of Copernican revolution in history in which the whole significance of history comes to be understood in a new systematically different social and cultural significance for us as agents. Now it's my claim that Kassir, uh, Jaspers, and Ortega all take up this changed uh, account of historical significance that comes with Kant's Copernican revolution in history. And that Copernican revolution in history, I can't show this here, actually undergirds Kant's Copernican revolution in metaphysics. So it's the ground level, and it's the ground level for all of these people of the Copernican revolution in metaphysics. It also brings with it a new conception of the human being as well as a new conception of what being is. So here's the Copernican reference, right? Uh, this is in that very same book in the context of the, this a uh, new understanding of history. Perhaps it lies in our wrongly taken choice of the standpoint from which we view the way human things happen that it seems counter to sense. It goes counter to perception as he remarks in the first critique about the Copernican hypothesis. The planets viewed from the earth are sometimes retrograde, sometimes standing still, sometimes going forward. According to the standpoint of the sun, which only reason can take up, they proceed constantly in their rule-guided way in accordance with the Copernican hypothesis. But it pleases some who are otherwise not unwise staunchly to persist in the way of explaining appearances and to the standpoint to which they have once committed themselves, even if they get up, get tied up in Tychonian cycles and epicycles to the point of absurdity. So this is the way Kant already saw those who were pushing back against the critical revolution. So in this account from the conflict of the faculties, you have a fundamental change in the way that Kant sees the idea of universal history from a cosmopolitan point of view. Past, present, and future are tied together by rememorative, demonstrative, and prognostic signs that bind together history for us in the unity of a narrative connected to what we as spectators do, the intervention that we make in responding to this world historical event. And with that, the whole conception of what gives organizing uh, unity to world history and to the history that underlies our systematic unification of the individual sciences and the science of the study of man and of metaphysics. So what I'm claiming is that this the French Revolution for Kant has a significance that extends to the very understanding of human beings in their historicity and in their being as well as being in general. And this then gets taken up by uh, both Jaspers and Ortega and I'll, I'll gradually get to that. So Ortega famously says I am I and my circumstance, and this goes back to a very early period when he had just come back from Marburg. So he already uh, early on in 1913 thinks of the human being as embedded in his or her circumstances, but this is going to be developed later into a full-fledged account of the systematicity of vital historical reason which provides us access to our own historical being and the circumstances in which we find ourselves and through that provides us access to being in general. 
So what I'm trying to do is explain basically how it is given uh, the Kantian background that uh, Jaspers and Ortega both take this new conception of history at reason to provide a way of understanding both the ontology of human beings and general ontology. So Ortega advocates a kind of perspectivism, but it's not a subjectivist perspectivism. I, he thinks that Nietzsche has a subjectivist perspective. I don't think he's right about that, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, the kind of perspectivism that he's committed to is a kind of Kantian uh, perspectivism where uh, the very being of things is constituted by the unity of their dynamic perspectives as those things are connected to their environment in uh, dynamically different uh, changing ways by the changing of one's standpoint. For, for Kant, and this is certainly the way that Kant is interpreted by Cassir in 1918, the Copernican re uh, revolution consists in grasping the one truth as the result of an ongoing process of communicative in inquiry that brings together all the different uh, perspective and unifies them in a system that gives significance to individual standpoints as unities of stand uh, of perspective. So the what comes first is the Copernican revolution where you have a system and that system allows you to identify uh, points within the system that can be constituted as unities of perspective. So the whole thing's a unity of perspective but each individual re relatum in the um, a framework is also a unity of perspective. Now, from this vantage point, one can also approach the notion of truth as disclosure. And I think that Ortega and his student are quite right that he has uh, a better claim to originality on this point than Heidegger. What Heidegger never acknowledges is that the fellow student in Marburg of Ortega's, Nikolai Hartmann, was already using the term Unverborgenheit to refer to Plato's conception of truth in 1909 before it was even thought by Heidegger, and uh, moreover, he's not even original with that. It comes from Teichmüller, uh, I, th I, I got this from Marias, who attributes it to his colleague in li linguistic, Leo Meyer. Now, my guess is that Hartmann gets it from Nator. Nator doesn't use it until uh, the 1920s, but then he actually puts it forward as his conception of, tr okay, I'll try to do this as fast as I can. Ortega seems superficially to reject what he calls the Kantian revolution as a philosophy for Vikings. And what he complains about there isn't so much the Marburg identification of being with thought, which he does reject too, but it's the idea that by making the Copernican revolution turn on the primacy of the practical and of the ought in relationship to the is, being becomes imperative based and thus a reason becomes ultimately, as he puts it, dictatorial, and that's why it's philosophy for the Vikings. Okay, but if you uh, pass to another discussion of Kant uh, in 1924, he says the following, in thinking of us as the lawgivers of nature and society, Ortega takes it that our a practical commitments are fundamental and unconditional. And he observes that this unconditionality is really grounded on, in our lives and thus in a vital reason. Vital reason is the reason that, that expresses what is of significance to me and others in my life. Vital reason thus becomes the basis on Ortega's view of Kant's very conception of reason. So vital reason expresses itself systematically as his 
historical reason. History is a system, this is okay, the system of human experiences linked in a single inexorable chain. History is a systematic science of that radical reality, my life. It is therefore a science of the present in the most rigorous and actual sense of the word. The past is in truth a live active force that sustains our today. And that's the conception that Kant articulates in the conflict of the faculties. And that Kassir actually explicitly takes up in those terms a, a few years before. Okay, so the past is not yonder at the date when it happened, but here in me. The past is I, by which I mean my life. Man set out himself, is brought up against himself as reality, as History, his past, is all he has. Here then, awaiting our study, lies man's authentic being, stretching the whole length of his path. Man is what has happened to him, what he has done. Man, in a word, has no nature. What he has is history. He has no other nature than what he has done. Hence, the expression historical reason must be understood in all the rigor of the term, not an extra historical reason which appears to be fulfilled in history, history, but literally a substantive reason constituted by what has happened to man. The revelation of a reality that transcends man's theories and which is himself the self underlying his theories. Okay, I'll, sorry. Uh, I just want to uh, maybe pull it together. So what I want to claim is that uh, this is the conception of uh, the temporality of being and of a human being uh, as it goes back to Kant and as it is taken up by Kassir and the Marburg School. And it's there actually that Husserl and Heidegger and uh, Ortega get it from. So he's uh, he really is, I, and I don't deny that at the time that Ortega was studying in Marburg, they hadn't gotten that far. So it's not a static school. There's a lot of development between 1909 and 1924 when Natov dies. Thank you. That was great. Um, is there any questions from anyone on the panel? So I know um, there was more to that since we didn't have uh, time, but I was wondering if you might um, speak a little bit more on this notion of uh, what, or what vision you think Jaspers had uh, for cosmopolitanism. Because I know for Ortega, of course, um, I believe his vision was so very much influenced by the situation in Spain. You know, this major problem with what he called the particularism that was apparent in this country, which I think still, still very much apparent today of just this lack of unity, right, in 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 the country. And so, for him, his vision and something that I think goes so forgotten ab about uh, his contributions is his early call for a European Union, mm -hmm. essentially. And and for him, that was precisely, I think, his his vision for cosmopolitanism. So I just wondered what you thought the Oscars might have shared in that sense with him, or what what his vision was more on that. Yeah, so I guess what I would uh, emphasize is that there's an ambiguity in the term cosmopolitanism. So most people, when they hear the word cosmopolitan, think of uh, a narrowly political notion. But actually, all the way back to the original use of the Greek term, it means citizen of the, of the cosmos. Uh, and in the thought of Jaspers and Ortega, I want to say their engagement with bringing to people together at the level of nations and societies is actually connected with their conception of ontology, of what the fundamental ground of being is. And what I want to say is that they are Kantians in this respect, and they inherit that Kantianism from the Marburg school. Thank you. Yes, I, I should have added um, that I didn't yeah, intend necessarily for it to be just about um, something political since, of course, I also noticed that shared vision of you know, the mass man of their time mm -hmm. and their concern of technology and, and how it was contributing to the problem. So, um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> There's so much to, to engage. A very, very provocative and interesting and good paper. I, I don't want to um, belabor the point about Marvel. The content clearly is important. Uh, and. Uh, and it's sort of interesting that the 
the, the essay you cited, the history, historia como sistema, the history of system. Uh, Ortega, it was, a, it was part of the festival for Casera. Mm -hmm. So so it's clear, and the, and the reference to the terrorism, mm -hmm. the laboratory, and mm -hmm. all that, it's, it's really con. But there is a point at which I wonder, one has to, I mean, create a boundary, as, as Yasu would say, with how far the influence of Kant is. He's very important, there's no doubt. You know, he is a seminal thinker. Uh, but in a way, one can make a case that what he was trying to do for history by way of this Copernican revolution, he derived from Hume trying to do it for morals, right? The Copernican revolution wanted to do for morals. And particularly since Hume sort of shook him out of his dogmatic slumber. So clearly he was influenced by Hume and recognized the limits of knowledge, but he goes beyond. So there's a point which you go beyond. Uh, and the, uh, but this line of using that image of the Copernican Revolution, many of whom thought they were bringing about something different, but Ortega, with respect to perspectivism, maintain a lot by way of, of the, the, the recent findings of Einstein, shattering the old, you know, uh, uh, um, unified universe of harmonies and this notion of relativity and, and, and bringing that into this aspect of, of perspectivism. I mean, there's so much uh, one, one could, could look at, but I'm, I'm wondering, though, the, um, uh, the, the, the background, and you're right, I think, that to say that the time they were there, that this, the influence of neo-Kantism sort of you know, ended, it, it went on, and it's through, Kassira played a very important part. But nonetheless, that group, were, they were still grappling with this issue of method, and they were, they were um, allured by these, these new tendencies on uh, this question of being. And Heidegger said that what he felt was the limit of the neo-Kantian influence was that it was dealt more with theory of knowledge, it became more an epistemological issue and not the ontolog ontological issue of the notion of being, right? So that's, uh, and, and not that being is not, you know, we go all the way back to the Greeks, it was there, but by way of a new, pro a new process for contemporary philosophy. Now, you may argue he's not the only one who does that, but that was his point of departure. Uh, yeah. and, 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 he, and so in his essay on, you know, in his lectures by, on, on Hegel's phenomenology of the, of, of, of the spirit or the mind, you know, he said, like, but even Hegel didn't go far enough, right? Uh, uh, but, but, this, but this trying to, because one of the problem with, with Kant is that I think they, they were so focused on the limitations of what you can do, and they felt that it, and that's why it was like a prison to take the image you used, right, when they yeah, were there. No, and then it was that constraint that, that, that they were, re, you know, wrestling with, that's all. So it doesn't mean that Kant was not influenced, mm -hmm. but he's not the only influence. No, oh, okay. I didn't, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. so I didn't mean to say that he's the only influence. What I did uh, mean to say is that if you understand these figures uh, uh, in their context, then you see that the things that look like they are uh, breaks with Kant actually come mm. straight from Kant. And I can show you the text. I can also mm -hmm. uh, trace the genealogy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, just like the question of the meaning of being. So uh, I have never uh, read anywhere uh, what, what uh, should have been an obvious point uh, to people, um, even from defenders of Kassir, that uh, Kassir uh, put the question of the meaning of being front and center in every volume of the philosophy of symbolic mm -hmm. form. They started with that. Mm -hmm. And he had specifically argued in uh, his um, uh, work on Kant of 1918 that Kant's Copernican revolution raised the question of the meaning of being for the first time. Mm -hmm. Now, it's my contention that Heidegger's whole methodology uh, depends on uh, borrowing from Kassir's Kantianism. It's a Kantianism that Heidegger, because of his um, uh, mixed attitude toward mm. Kant, which comes partly to the hostility of mm. the Brentano school mm. against right. Kant, right. but the, uh, the, mm. the Kantianism of his uh, teacher Ricca, whom he's also hostile mm. to, mm. so it's all mm. very mm. overdetermined. But if you look closely, where uh, my question is, uh, you have in Kassir account of Kant, an account of how we can address the question of the meaning of being. And that's what Kassir puts front and center in his understanding of Kant's revolution in metaphysics and ontology. Now, 
uh, he also puts that front and center in his own philosophy. And, and, and that's something that Heidegger had studied before he uh, had published anything on this uh, topic. So uh, it can't be, he can't claim any originality for this stuff. I mean, if, if, if somebody else has already presented the view, right, and I could go through that's and so reconstruct right. all of uh, being and time as a critical appropriation mm -hmm. without attribution mm -hmm. of uh, Kassir. But Diltai is a part of that. Sure, well. okay. yeah, yeah. And, and then the only other thing I would add is that this vitalism, you know, it goes beyond the Bergson and in the actual, because sure. what he does in neither vitalism nor rationalism, he raises that issue, but it's also the sense of, of, uh, of vital reason. And, and again, you might make the same argument, because even Diltai wanted to write a critique of historical reason, right. drawing upon, you know, the influence yeah. of that, and I would, I would acknowledge that, I agree right. with that. And, 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 the, and, and Descartes is, I mean, uh, uh, Ortega is picking it up right. with his sense of historical reason, right? Right. Uh, yes. Yeah, so my view is Kant already wrote the critique of historical <laughs> reason, but Diltai didn't understand Kant well enough no. to see it there. Uh, or rather, was influenced by Kant's thought without being able to see that this was Kant's view. But he brings a, a dimension of historicity by way of temporality of the human being you know, you might make an argument about the, the whole role of the autobiography that's involved with that. And Jasper picks up with a little bit of that right. himself because he yeah, engages sure, in, that, yeah. in that medium. Uh, but it's fascinating stuff, you know. Thank you, everyone. No, thank you for your hard work and for your great, you know, talks and presentations. And thank you, everyone, who showed up for your support and for interacting and uh, spending the evening with us. Thank you. Thank you.